Now, fascinating paleoanthropological data suggest that the late Pleistocene, around 130,000 years ago, was a time of archaic human population contact and possibly dispersal in Central Asia. Geographic and paleoclimatic data suggest that a natural corridor through Kazakhstan linked areas to the north and east, including Siberia and China, to those further to the west and south, such as Europe, the Middle East and Uzbekistan, much akin to a Paleolithic Silk Road. In fact, Neanderthals may have traveled the same route as the famous Silk Road to China, long before it became famous. Homo neanderthalensis, also known by some experts as Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, was a late archaic form of human that diverged from modern human lineages no earlier than 500,000 years ago and had largely vanished from Europe and Asia by 40,000 years ago. Many researchers recognize modern humans and Neanderthals as subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, based on their overlapping morphology and genetics. Neanderthal remains have been discovered throughout Europe and the Middle East, but a fossil skull from China known as Marba may be the most eastern Neanderthal fossil. The Marba hominin cranium is thought to have a face morphology similar to Neanderthals, as well as similar inner ear structure. This partial skull, dated between 120,000 and 140,000 years ago, bears striking resemblances to European Neanderthals, and its discovery in southern China suggests that Neanderthals travelled further east than previously believed. Another study confirms the existence of three distinct Neanderthal subgroups, each with minor differences, and suggests the possibility of a fourth group in Western Asia. The study discovered that the size of the Neanderthal population fluctuated over time, and there was some migration between subgroups. Archaeologists acknowledge that there are few anthropological remains from the Middle Pleistocene. Some consider the two 250,000-year-old Neanderthal skulls discovered in Sacco Pastore in Italy to be two of the earliest known Neanderthals. Nonetheless, debate continues as the Sacco Pastore skulls deviate from the classic Neanderthal model. Given that the Marba skull belongs to a mature female, it is reasonable to assume that the cranium Sacopastore does as well. The skull had a unique appearance due to its large size, receding forehead, massive orbital ridges, and flattened brain box. The skull of this fossil appears strange even to an observer with a basic understanding of anatomy because of the hollow brow ridges. Hollow brow ridges are a unique feature found in only a few ancient skulls, including the mysterious Petrolona skull of Greece. This is fascinating because of the mysteries and unanswered questions about our ancient brothers and sisters, which we will discuss later in the video. Sacopastore I is the skull of a mature Neanderthals woman. Despite the lack of zygomatic arches and the mandible, it is nearly completely intact and heavily mineralized. Quarry workers damaged the skull after it was discovered. This included several broken and lost dental crowns, as well as other damage to the supraorbital area and two holes punctured in the vault's frontal and parietal areas. Meanwhile, Sacopastore II is a less complete cranium found near the first skull. This second Sacopastore skull is male and missing the entire vault, the left front orbital areas, and a portion of the base. Because one skull is a mature female and the other is a young adult male, the morphological differences between the two skulls are believed to be caused by sexual dimorphism. The cranial capacity is estimated to be between 1,280 and 1,300 cubic centimetres, with a smaller facial size than a classic Neanderthal, but larger than the first Sacopastore skull. In fact, the specimen's enormous estimated cranial capacity and encephalization quotient are consistent with the rapidly increasing brain capacity observed in the later Wormian period Neanderthals. The skulls are most likely between 100,000 and 300,000 years old and exhibit extremely high levels of fossilization. The two skulls were assigned to the Tyrrhenian stage based on geomorphological classification because they were found on a small hill about five meters above the river. This specimen is the best preserved and most complete of those found in Europe from this time period. Its Neanderthal identity indicates that the preceding cold stage which occurred between 200,000 and 130,000 years ago, 
was most likely decisive in the definition of the Neanderthal phenotype, reducing the extent of genetic variation in previous European populations and resulting in a more homogeneous gene pool. According to anatomical rules, the female Neanderthal's large body, wide trunk and short limbs were to be expected, as hominins at the time relied more on their physical body as a cold adaptation, because their technological culture was not as advanced as later hominins. For example, the female Neanderthal specimen from Grotte du Prince in France, dating from the early late Pleistocene, a hundred thousand years ago, has an estimated body mass of 74.0 kg, making it the largest female Neanderthal ever discovered and the second largest archaic female. Body size in humans peaked during the middle Pleistocene, so the specimen's size is not surprising, especially given its middle latitude and cold climate. Because of their large size, the fossils were initially thought to be from a male individual, implying she was an absolute unit. The female hunter is a huntress. Neanderthals, both male and female, hunted large birds to use their feathers for personal adornment. These ancient hunters used wooden throwing sticks like boomerangs to hunt birds, demonstrating their advanced hunting, woodworking and arboreal knowledge. Other research also indicates that Neanderthals also adorned themselves with raptor talons. In fact, Neanderthals had a preference for dark feathers, which they obtained from birds of prey and ravens. Not only that, but these ancient humans appeared to prefer birds with dark or black plumage. Ravens, crows, rooks, magpies, jackdaws, different types of eagles and vultures, red and black kites, kestrels and falcons are among the species found at Neanderthals' sites. It is tantalizing to image a Neanderthal huntress dressed in black plumage and an eagle talon necklace. According to the study, due to the latitude of the cranium's location, researchers decided to give the reconstruction only medium skin tone. Whatever the case, it is difficult to reconstruct an individual's skin tone and hair color without genetic information, but limited genetic studies show that most Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens had brown skin, hair, and eyes. However, the shape of Neanderthals' soft parts, such as their eyes, ears, and lips, remains unknown, along with pigmentation and hair type. Scientists can't tell how soft tissue overlaid bones, so facial reconstruction is always based on artistic license. Furthermore, many Neanderthal traits can be found in modern humans to varying degrees, owing to both archaic admixture and the persistence of ancestral hominid traits shared with Neanderthals and other archaic humans. Neanderthal anatomy differed from modern human anatomy in that they had a stronger build and distinct morphological features, particularly on the cranium, which gradually evolved into more derived aspects, especially in isolated geographic regions. This robust build was an effective adaptation for Neanderthals who lived in cold climates across Europe. They also had to operate in Europe's dense forest landscape, which was vastly different from the environments of grassland plains where their ancestors had evolved a different anatomical structure. Interestingly, Neanderthals apparently often squatted as a resting position rather than sitting. An analysis of Neanderthal metric and non-metric lower limb variations, which were previously thought to indicate squatting, suggests that squatting was a common repose position among these Pleistocene hominids. The crouching position, shared by fossil man and some living peoples, is also an ancestral remnant. This is an example of how individual evolution recalls and replicates the evolution of the ancestral race. For example, the overall appearance of the Neanderthal foot suggests greater mobility and freedom than modern humans. The foot, which is only slightly arched, must have rested on the ground on its outer edge and assumed a natural in-toed position. The great toe's wide separation suggests that it may have served as a prehensile organ. In other words, the foot was gorilla-like, in that it could be used for grasping, which we can still see in a few modern living populations. Although it is often suggested that the large eyes of Neanderthal man evolved as a result of the low light conditions in Ice Age Europe, this is a null hypothesis because tropical fossils also have extremely large eye sockets. The Neanderthal skull's large eye sockets may have provided the necessary space for huge eyes, enabling improved visual acuity and low-light vision. 
This adaptation could have been beneficial for the species in their specific ecological niche, such as environments with dense vegetation or during periods of twilight or nocturnal activity. The larger eyes would have allowed for capturing more light and enhancing the ability to detect movement or spot potential prey or predators. The ecological context in which the species inhabited could have influenced the size of the eye sockets. For example, having larger eyes and eye sockets could have been advantageous for scanning large expanses and detecting potential threats or resources from a distance. Alternatively, larger eyes would have been beneficial for navigating through complex forest environments. Indeed, the larger eye sockets in the skull may have been an adaptation to accommodate the neural circuitry needed for effective visual perception and interpretation, as they would have provided a greater influx of visual information and necessitated a corresponding increase in the brain's processing capabilities. Neanderthal man had a muscular build, prominent brow ridges, and a broad face, making him a powerful and adaptable hominid. The Neanderthal fossil depicts a powerful race with the most prominent brow ridges of any known hominid. His massive and heavy face is much more simian in appearance than modern man, with enormous inflated brow ridges that are particularly conspicuous and extended. In addition to making people more aggressive, testosterone influences how human skulls grow. Our Neanderthal relatives, both male and female, had a large brain and thick, heavy bones with powerful muscle attachments. Neanderthals would have been extraordinarily strong by modern standards, and their skeletons show that they led brutally hard lives. Neanderthals also had much thicker necks than modern humans to support their massive, elongated skulls. Both the back of the skull and the powerful, chinless jaw exhibit muscle attachments that clearly distinguish such a neck. Even women of the Neanderthal race had extremely thick brow ridges and huge necks. Hermann Schaffhausen in Germany and Aldous Huxley in England dubbed it the most bestial of all known human skulls, emphasizing its simian or monkey-like characteristics. It was once thought that Neanderthals lived only in caves in astonishing states of savagery, ran about as naked as a monkey, eat human flesh, drank from human skulls, and uttered sounds more like wild beasts than human speech. Their conquest and extermination may have been celebrated by the first modern humans to conquer Europe. Indeed, for much of the last century, Neanderthals were portrayed as knuckle-dragging brutes, whose extinction around 40,000 years ago was the natural result of competing with a more intelligent, creative, and resourceful human species, Homo sapiens. And with that, we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human history. Until next time, stay curious and stay questioning. Please subscribe, share and check out our channel's other videos. Thank you and take care.